Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, episode number 416, Causes of Obesity in America Continued. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about hormone replacement therapy for women, which is available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. So last week when we were talking about habits and habituation in terms of eating, things that we learned to in the way that we relate to food, and in our food behaviors. Mm-hmm. We talked about a lot of things that we can do to, to learn those habits and to try to unlearn or relearn those habits. Mm-hmm. But where we left off at the end of our conversation, we were talking about uh, the volume of food mm-hmm. that we ingest and, and the volume of the wrong kinds of food. Mm-hmm. And so today we want to talk about the Harvard food plate which is a new iteration from the federal government about the way that you should eat and what you should eat. We used to, when I grew up, we all learned the food pyramid. And it was wrong. And it was wrong. And we were and told for 30 they, to they, 40 years the wrong thing, now which the, made us fat. The government has admitted that it was wrong. It was scientifically incorrect. Mm-hmm. And in part, it was developed as a way to promote the sales of corn in the world. And wheat. And, and so our diets got skewed to favor those two ingredients, which are in those quantities, not healthy for us. Mm -hmm. And so we need to restrict our consumption of corn and corn syrup in particular, corn sugars and and wheat, uh, and eat other things. So Mm -hmm. they've come out with a new design or a new recommendation called the Harvard Food Plate. And so we're going to be talking about that. But the beginning of our conversation has to do with the volume that we eat. Mm -hmm. So we always talk about calories. Calories are really hard to talk about when you're talking about, I mean, when you're eating a no, meal. I'm, I'm laughing because when we were starting this conversation, Kathy was telling me about grams. She was looking stuff up and it's like, oh, you need so many grams of meat. Of protein. Yeah, protein. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I don't know how much a gram is. I have no concept. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and she said, well, what about calories? I said, I don't know about that either. <laughs> right. You know, I know an amount of food. Well, people always ask me, how much protein should I have a day? Yeah. You know, and, and I believe and that they do because you do have ask a diet program that. and you're having yeah. these conversations. But. And and they basically basically you shouldn't have to count grams or or calories. calories. You should know that about three to four ounces of meat or fish or eggs or that's ounces that about the are size about of that, the palm of the palm an adult's of your palm. Hand. That, 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 that should be space. your protein that you have at a meal. Not 16 ounces of a hamburger. I mean, oh my gosh, that's a, I mean, a pound or of a hamburger pound steak. is, or a pound steak, or I've gone to restaurants where they have 16 to 18 to 24 ounces of yes. steak. It looks like half an animal. Yeah. And then, I mean, if I ever ordered that by mistake, which would be the only way I'd order it, I'd eat like this much and they'd say, don't you like it? I'm like, well, it could feed an entire neighborhood, yeah. but yes, I like it, but I'm going to take it home oh. because- and there's nothing wrong with doing that. Don't eat it after you're full, that's for sure. But we eat too much of everything. Yeah, and, and you know, in America, you can comfortably ask for uh, what we call a doggy bag. I mm-hmm. want to take this food home mm-hmm. for another meal because I've paid for it. And you've fixed it and mm-hmm. I want to eat it. But in Europe, that's just now becoming a thing that people do pretty regularly in restaurants. Mm-hmm. I, I have my friends from France tell me that the French government passed a law last in the last year or two that now requires restaurants to give you the food that you've bought if you don't eat it on site. And so if you ask for a doggy bag, mm-hmm. they have to give you one. Well, that keeps but you from they overeating didn't used to there. Have to. But their portions aren't like ours. That's true. I mean, and except for the franchises that have ended up over there, like McDonald's and that kind of thing, their portions are very small and very tasty. And you have lots of different... Um, d- different um, plates that come and you get all these little tiny things that taste great, but it's not a big portion. So no, you, not, not. A, you wouldn't take a lot of this stuff home because you can eat that little tiny bit. 
Well, and they don't it's serve a lot of plates, a uh, small plates. They, you basically, like, we were in Italy and we'd order pasta and you would get a, a serving of some kind of pasta. And that's all you got. You right. Get, it was a cup or a cup and a half at the most, uh -huh. but not like six cups of pasta with stuff all over it like we see here. Right. And I'm not sure exactly how that happened. Maybe it was because... It's always well, about partly, money, honey, partly right? Because they make it fresh. <laughs> yeah, and but from fresh ingredients, right? And so it's not as easy to make so much of it. Yeah, that's true. But I think it's always about money. They can charge more if they give you a ton of it. So if we're talking about volume in the regular household, what the Harvard Food Plate recommends is that you get about four ounces of protein, mm -hmm. and that the volume of fruits and vegetables, which should be fresh fruits and green leafy vegetables should be twice the size of the protein on your plate. Right. Half so a plate full. Should half be vegetables of your plate and fruit. should be fruit and vegetables. A smaller portion should be the protein, whatever the protein mm -hmm. is. And then the Harvard Food Plate recommends what they call healthy proteins, which uh, fish, nuts. Uh, lean meat. Lean, but not red meat. They say stay away from red meat as much as you can. Chicken. Chicken, fish. pork. Yeah, fish. So that's what they recommend, but there's nothing wrong with lean beef. No, but they, but they also lamb. say stay away from processed, what are called processed meats, like deviled ham, bologna, uh, bacon. Right. I would much rather have someone eat uh, a small filet. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could share a filet. Yeah. And well, have that. We do all the it's time. It's very lean. It's all protein. It's not going to hurt. Red meat doesn't hurt you unless mm -hmm. you eat the fat that's around it. Yeah. So that that's not bad for you. They they've somehow decided okay, so, that that's a problem. So there's a fad diet. I don't know. If it's a fad diet. I will call it. A All fad diets diet. are fads. Yeah, but there's a diet that's uh, growing in popularity in the United States called the keto diet. Mm -hmm. And in the keto diet, they eat a lot of red meat and mm -hmm. they eat a lot of fat. I know. Because they focus more on fat consumption than carb consumption. They're trying to make you keto ke ketogenic. ketotic or. Yeah. yeah, so that you spill ketones, which means, that means in your urine you have ketones. That's a way to test whether you're really losing fat. So if you're not eating carbs and you're eating the the um, proteins, animal then, fat. yeah, animal fat, yeah. then they feel that you're losing weight. You're probably losing fat, probably losing water. You may not be losing actual weight. Yeah. It just, but... A lot of people like it and do well on it, but we'll talk about that, why certain people do well on certain diets and certain people don't. We're talking about genetics. Genetics. Some okay. of us, no diet works for everyone. Right. So even when we're talking about this plate, the choices are different <clears throat> dependent on your genetics, and your genetics are is marked by, by your blood type. Well, and culturally, in regions of the United States, certain foods are sort of culture-centric. Well, that's true. Because I grew up in the South, and I thought my grandmother was a fabulous cook. I lived with my grandmother for a number of years. And I thought she was a great cook. She only knew how to boil or fry. Those, I mean, I've subsequently learned mm -hmm. as an adult, mm -hmm. everything that we ate was either fried. She kept, like, bacon grease in an aluminum can on the stove. Yeah, I keep, know. Keep Just it out in the heat. To keep it from solidifying. Right. So you could always just dip and use it when you were going to fry something. Uh, That's and, really unhealthy. And she boiled <laughs> it's just beans and, and peas. We like, we were having conversations as we were preparing for this show. I, I grew up thinking that a meal was a, a bowl of freshly boiled beans and a slab of cornbread. That's all you had. That was the meal. So that's what you ate. Mm -hmm. When I got married to Phyllis, and I said, oh, let's have some meat because it's a comfort food. It's a southern, for, for mm -hmm. uh, where I grew up, it, mm -hmm. for me, it's a comfort food. When I get certain levels of stress, Carby. I start craving mm -hmm. that. So I would fix that. And Phyllis would, I'd say, oh, I'll fix dinner. I'll fix navy beans and cornbread. And she'd be like, well, okay, what else are you going to have? I was like, that's you have the a meal. salad? That's or are you going to have no. fruit? Or are you going to have... No, 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 so, no never. So even though that comforted you, it yeah. was unhealthy. Yes, of course. I, I, But I still, once or twice a year, get a craving for that. So then you can and have a salad with it, it and fruit way. for dessert. Well, but that's, you know, that's why Phyllis is there. Yeah. But that's, in, in America, we have, we have. Fried chicken. <laughs> food that's bad for us in every area of America. Yes. Just different kind of food that's yeah. bad for us. You don't 
have to eat that way. When they call a Mediterranean diet, that's why they don't call it, you know, the Philadelphia diet. They call it the Mediterranean diet because everyone has their own garden. They may, they grow their own food. They eat what is what is in season. They don't boil it. They steam it or they saute it or they don't, boiling takes all the goodness out of food. I mean, it just goes out with the water. So, so basically they, they, a Mediterranean diet is lean meats, lots of fish, and fresh fruit and vegetables. So that's why we don't have a diet named after us in America. But when I'm talking about genetics, I'm talking about most of us are are from um, European genetics, but if you go far back, we're all from African genetics. But, but at some point, the people started out with O blood type, and they were hunter-gatherers. They eat meat. And they eat things that you could that are growing along the side of the road, basically. Yes. Anything you don't have to farm, no grains. We, we did a couple of uh, podcasts mm-hmm. a couple of years ago uh, on the blood type and diet issues that mm-hmm. were written. That, that we were taking materials for that to, to support the, the conclusions from a Dr. book. Dr. Dodamo. Dr. Dodamo. Eat right for your it type. It was a father and son combination mm-hmm. of doctors who specialized and did all the their research focus, on this. their research on that. But they but they've recently found that the the genetics that you carry with you for your metabolism and what you need to eat to be healthy is on the same locus as your blood type. So so it's okay. helpful to divide you into groups. The problem comes if O's are meat eaters and A's are agrarian, meaning you eat what you grow like fruit and vegetables and, and lamb and and some animals, but not a large amount of red meat, chickens, eggs are okay, milk is okay, then ABs are much more um, finicky. They have fewer foods that are good for them. And then B is, is the um, nomad. You eat as you walk along the road, basically, and that's mostly venison and that kind of thing. What happens when you're in a family like mine where I'm a B and my husband's an A and my daughter's an O? Yeah. I mean, so, then what do you cook? Well, <laughs> yeah, that's a real challenge. Basically, you know, if you jump back to the Mediterranean diet, everybody's going to be happy. Mm. And you stay away from refined foods, most people in the family will be well fed. Mm-hmm. So, so we're not talking about regional cultural influences. Right. We're talking about the genetics of digesting food, processing food, growing. And what is good for your body individually. And, and so how does one learn? Through, through mm-hmm. blood type? Mm-hmm. You get your blood tested? You can, and do, what- you can do a blood type. Um, you can have it tested at the lab or you can do a blood type test. It's like eight bucks Amazon. You just go on yeah. for a blood type test and they send you everything you need and you can find out what your blood type is. And then that would give you a reference for the kinds of food that your body would most healthily benefit from. Yeah. All right. So, so it's kind of like, you know, the O is kind of like the African blood type, the original blood type. And like, I don't think there's pineapples in Africa and there's no wheat. It wouldn't be wheat that you would have to grow. It would be what's natural, what was naturally there. Mm -hmm. So it would, it would be things that grow naturally without farming. So that's that's what the uh, what the O diet is most like. Yeah. So so finding the right diet for you is also essential. Not just finding a diet that is that is without the bad the bad stuff like preservatives and and unhealthy fats. But then you have to take that anything can be bad for you if you eat too much of it. Right. So then you have to make sure you get it onto one plate that's not in large and not not piled up like Heaped this. Up. Yeah. That's that's not healthy either. I don't, I'm not sure that anyone can eat that much unless they've worked all day in the fields, maybe. Yeah. Or worked all day on a farm. You certainly or can't in do it day in and job. day out, day after day after day. They even then, even then, it may not be healthy. But that brings us to exercise. Exercise. <laughs> I knew that was coming. <laughs> and you know, you, you can't be healthy if you sit in a chair all day. Right. You're going to get swollen. You're not going to burn any calories. It is, it is not good for anyone to just sit in a chair and do nothing all day. Well, and that's one of the reasons as a parent, you limit your child's access to media because they will sit in a chair and watch television or play on their phone or play video games or what have you. And, and little children, toddlers to six, seven years old, actually, you, if you watch your kid, the, 
the television shows train them, habituate them mm-hmm. to do this, like Sesame Street, mm-hmm. where the kids are mesmerized by the show and they watch the show and they sit really still and they don't move mm-hmm. until there's a break. And then they explode. They, mm-hmm. they do cartwheels. And they jump around the room and they yell and run. And they come back and sit down for the next segment. And so they are trained to focus their attention, have it interrupted, release all of their energy, come back and sit down and focus mm-hmm. their attention again. And, and, and it's done on purpose. Yeah, that's true. Because kids need to move. And because we need to, <laughs> and when they we, need to sell stuff. And so when kids to, stop moving is when we... St- Put them in school and tell them to sit at a desk. And that's the beginning of the end. And then we take away, we, we are so conscious of, I mean, I'm big about brain power and learning as much as you can, but you have to exercise to get your brain in gear. Yeah. You need muscle movement for your brain to work all day. And we've taken out recess and gym and in the, a lot president, of the president's, cities, yeah, the president's uh, award fitness, for physical fitness. Which we all started with John all Kennedy that, and his brother Robert. Which was a good thing for all of us yeah. who, who did that. We yeah. were all competing so that we could get that award. Right. I mean, that was, otherwise I would have just sat and draw. I wouldn't watch TV, but I would do quiet creative stuff. I wouldn't have been outside doing things, yeah. but that made me do it. Well, and if you partner in life with someone who has a different response to exercise or a different kind of exercise Mm -hmm. rhythm than you have, Mm -hmm. then you run the risk of making that adaptation from both sides where you end up primarily sedentary. Right. And and you need to find your own rhythm and way and time to exercise. And if your partner does those same things, that's great. Mm -hmm. If you both play golf together, if you both hike, whatever. Mm -hmm. But if you don't, then you each need to do your own. Or you need to bring them with you. And do your do something active so they don't stay home and have a heart attack. You know, so that's harder, but it's but it's only going to cost you energy, time, and money to have your spouse sick yeah. or not not able to uh, catch up with you yeah. and not able to walk when you go on vacation and do things like that. It's yes. it is so very important to move around during the day that even if you're at a sedentary job, you should be able to get up. When people have smoking breaks, and instead of having smoking breaks, go run in place or do push-ups or do something. I mean, I used to close the door in my office. My son works and, in the office. And, and do sit-ups. They actually have a stand-up desk. He has a desk that when he's tired of sitting, he can stand up and he can still work. Uh-huh. But then when he's tired of standing, he can sit back down. Right. So that's helpful. That's helpful. And a lot of people who uh, have really active brains have active bodies too. So they're mm-hmm. moving while they're thinking. Mm-hmm. And that that is a very... Um, advanced company. I mean, yeah. they're really thinking about that. Now, nobody in my office really sits. So, yeah. I mean, except me, maybe. Exactly. So, because they're always running around after the patients and taking care of them. And even the people on the phone are moving all around. So, we don't have that issue, but we still have to go work out. Right. And have consistent exercise. So, you recommend what? Three, three times a week. Three times a week. For, and you should do it for an hour, or you could do it twice that day for half an hour, but... You should have sustained exercise so that your heart rate gets up and that you can warm up and cool down. So generally between 20 and 30 minutes, you get your heart rate up if you're Mm -hmm. exercising at a moderate pace. Uh, And you need to do that at least three hours worth every week. Which is not much compared to what a week holds in hours. No, it's not much, but it's... But you have to schedule it. Some people have to schedule it. Some people have to have a friend that they exercise with that will... We'll call them and say, you're not exercising. What's wrong with you? You know, somebody who will be accountable. You can be accountable to, or you have to do something that you love. Like I'm going to go exercise because I love my trainer and I like talking to her and, and she's this and she's that, you know, so somebody who's your friend who helps you work out or somebody that, or something that you love to do, like be outside. If you love to be outside, you should choose being outside whenever possible and exercising outside. Everybody has their own type of exercise. I play tennis that with my they son love. because I love winning. <laughs> President Trump said I'm going to be tired of winning at some point. <laughs> I can't comment <laughs> because I have nothing to say about. You have nothing politics. to say about that at all. <laughs> so, but exercise is so important. Moderation of your food, the volume of your food, the way that you eat, the way you shop in the grocery store. Shop around the outside of the grocery store where the fresh green things are mm-hmm. and the fresh fruits and vegetables are. Eat Don't, a salad every day. Every day. I wouldn't go that. You, yes, you have to eat a salad every day. 
I mean, and I don't care how big the salad is. There's not enough calories in that. To- <laughs> Get a really good salad and put on a big donut. That was- <laughs> You're <laughs> hopeless. <laughs> At any rate, what we hope you've acquired through these last four episodes about obesity is some information that you can use to understand some of the food issues that you may have in your in your family, some of the ways that you should approach preparing food, buying food, consuming food, the importance of thinking about what you do instead of just going on autopilot and following your habits or responding to inattentiveness, like in front of a TV or reading a book while you eat. It's important to think about healthy living so that you can begin to healthily, healthily live. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the BioBalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit BioBalanceHealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at Facebook.com slash BioBalanceHealth. Find Brett Newcomb at BrettNewcomb.com.